This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I want to ride, 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 ride. Are you being your authentic self? You'll likely say, of course I am. But are you? Or have you perhaps fallen into the trap of wearing different masks depending on the situation? Doing what you need to do so that you fit in. Joining me today is Todd Nyholm to chat about the importance of being your authentic self. Welcome to the roller coaster, Todd. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to talk with you. The conversation around authenticity, it comes up time and time again, but I don't know if people are actually understanding what that means. So I'm wondering if you could share, what does it mean to be your authentic self? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, what it is, is being able to act and think and use your emotions in a way that isn't constrained by programming that other people gave you. So the stuff you got in your childhood, the stuff that your family does, the things that your culture does, the things that your education does, it's all layered on top of you that you try to live with all the time in order to uh, sort of meet other people's expectations or meet the expectations of the culture. And so when you're really authentic, you still remember all that stuff. You still know what people are expecting. So you're not crazy and wild and making trouble for yourself and everyone else, but you're still able to be who you are within the society itself. But in my experience, and in fact, I had recently had a conversation about this with a family member who told me that I have to put my feelings aside and be a different person depending on the situation. And my response was, well, no, I can't be somebody else just to please that group of people I'm in. This is who I am. And you either accept me or you don't. And I'm okay. I have to be okay with the outcome. When you're, I believe when you're truly aligned with your authentic self, you're more confident in who you're who you are. And you, you know, you're okay if other people don't accept you. Yeah, I think if you're really authentic, you're you're okay with people not liking you, and you're okay with certain opportunities kind of going away because you want to be who you are. And particularly when it comes to emotions, there's almost this idea that they should all either be suppressed or say they should just run all over you. And so to really work with your own emotions is really important so that other people aren't poking at them all the time to control your behavior, which is another thing that'll get you away from being authentic is when people can run your emotions a bit over you. And it's one of the things I really learned in martial arts. If you can make someone angry, you can direct them where they don't want to go because you have them just a bit out of control. So the emotions is are really important when it comes to authenticity. And a lot of who you really are will show up through your emotions. And there's a real intelligent and conscious way to work with them. And we don't really get taught that almost what we get taught is the opposite, just suppress them, just be what we want you to be, just do what we want you to do, you know, all that kind of thing and really shows up in family dynamics, because they're the closest to you and really becomes obvious and it goes out there from from there in your social situations and circles. Yeah, definitely. Who you are, it starts as a young child within your own family unit, because you you are, and I'm using air quotes here, taught what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And it's not necessarily until you get later on in life that you can make those decisions where you can say, hey, wait a second. I don't believe or I don't align with what you're telling me or what you're telling, how you're telling me to be. And I have to be myself. Yeah, there's a real interesting thing about like the education we have and then also the punishments we receive. And so a lot of what people think of as education is is punishments. It's causing pain. You know, we're going to ostracize you over there. Back in my day, you'd be spanked or slapped or whatever. And, you know, all the things that went with it for not conforming to what's expected of you. And this is where it gets a little tricky because you want to be your authentic self, but not so much that it completely gets you cast out. And so you have to be really careful, in my opinion, with being your authentic self in a way that you still have a good relationship with the people around you and you're getting rid of the people that aren't going to let you have a good relationship with them. And sometimes that means you got to start all over, build your own family, build your own unit. Maybe you have to move three States over um, so that you can really be who you are because people have expectations and 
oftentimes they're really hurt if you're not doing things the way they want you to, whether it's in your best interest or not, they may not even consider that, you know, if you don't start with your own feelings and you don't start with your own thoughts, you can get really lost and mired in what other people expect for you and not necessarily know the difference. A lot of people haven't even really pulled it apart to see. In your journey, how has connecting to your authentic self helped you and sort of created the life that you've wanted to live? Yeah, I think fundamentally you feel more alive when you're your own authentic self and you start to feel more and more sort of dead if you aren't. And to me, that's the fundamental purpose that we kind of have as individuals and authentic people. So the life comes through us. It is part of us. And the less you are yourself, the more drained you become. And so if you talk to a lot of people like I do at the clinic, many of them feel tired all the time and they're exhausted and they're always putting on these fronts and these faces for other people so that they can live up to those expectations. But over more and more time, they get more and more tired and they become sick and eventually their body can completely rebel and have significant Ill illnesses and problems. And I was struggling with that. So a lot of this I got trying to heal myself from some health problems I had and some significant trauma I had as a kid. And so I was sort of forced against the corner to figure it out. Um, and that became really important for me and sort of a obsession of mine to figure out how to live life well through my own efforts. But that always starts with you because what might make me feel really wonderful might not be something that you're into. You know, I spend hours like researching how a liver moves, but most people aren't interested in knowing how to move a liver in, in their torso. It, it doesn't even connect to them, you know, um, and other people might be like my dad loves cars and I like him enough that I can hang out with him. But boy, he just loves them. He would love to tell me about a 1968 Ford Mustang or something. And it's interesting for me to hear him say it, but the thing itself doesn't sort of light me on fire like maybe this conversation is. I love talking about this stuff. So yeah. And you mentioned what happens when we don't connect to our authentic selves. And certainly in my experience, I lived the large portion of my life trying to fit in. And I would keep, you know, I'd keep going through this, you know, never ending circle of trying to fit in and trying to do everything right. And then you get pulled back, you know, you're pulled to be your authentic self. And you try and live like that. And then you realize that, hey, wait a second, you're not fitting in and you're causing all of these problems in the family. So then you go back to trying to fit in and you end up in this vicious circle. And for me, it just led to pain and depression. And it wasn't until I was able to say, well, wait a second, that's not who I am. But the problem is that because my family only ever knew the mask, they don't even know who the real me is. And that's the challenge is how do you even reconcile that? Yeah, and that's always an ongoing sort of conversation with yourself. You know, where are you and where are the people around you? You know, and how are they treating you and how are you treating yourself? And unconsciously, you'll do all kinds of things because they're expected of you until you really figure out, oh, these things are pushing on me. I have this programming here and my family put it there and they know how to push on it over here. For instance, shame or guilt, maybe. Like, if you don't come to the party, we're, you know, you'll really hurt my feelings and those kinds of things. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm sick. I need to be at home right now. Or I just need time to get over the week because I had a busy week. And as an introvert, I need time to recover my energy or whatever. So there's all these little things that you have to pick up over time, but it's an ongoing conversation that I don't think is ever done. And if you aren't able to tap into your authentic self and who you really are, I think it always leads to some kind of health problem over enough time, or at very least you just start to feel tired and uninterested and bored and then you can really get into bad depression. And it's really an interesting thing to watch people go down further over time. Yeah, it's not a fun place to be, that's for sure. Not at all. <laughs> Again, speaking from experience, it's just, you know, everything about those interactions just eventually just feels so wrong. Yeah, and there's a part of you talking to with that, you know, and you're like, why does this feel so wrong to me? You know, everyone else thinks this is fine. Why do I not? want to do this or be here for this. And that's where you really end, end up like connecting to yourself. And at first it's kind of painful. And you're like, why is it only me? <laughs> why am I the only one that doesn't want to do this? And everyone else in my family does, you know, and yeah, it's a real art. And I think it's an art in the sense that you got to follow it and play with it and try to make it beautiful on your own. And that's a great way to do it. It's like, how do I make this beautiful? So it works out for me. And it's much better than I'm going into a fight with my family or I'm going into a fight with my neighbors. You know, how can I make this artistically work out for me and my life going forward? Yes, because you can be pegged as the black sheep or difficult or attention seeking. And you're like, no, I'm just, 
I just, I just want to be me. Just leave me alone. If, if I can't be me within the confines of this group, then just leave me alone. Let me be. Yeah. And the more authentic you are, the more you're okay with yourself, the easier that will be to say, well, if, if you guys need me to be this way, I can't be that way. So I'm going to go have a piece of pizza with the dog and watch the sunset on my own. You know, <laughs> you might have to be okay with that. Or maybe your, maybe your lover leaves you or, or maybe your best friends are like, man, we can't do this with you anymore. Cause you're not like we are, all we do is drink and you don't want to drink anymore, whatever it might be. I'm just trying to use some obvious examples, but the more okay you are with yourself, the better you're going to feel even when it's quiet and there's no distractions. And that's tricky when you need other people's approval to feel okay. And the yeah. more, authentic you are the less you'll need that and i find that when you do find the courage to say hey no this is who i am sure relationships and and whether they could just be friends or they could be family members they may fall to the wayside but in time those people that you are aligned to they will find their way into your lives there can be moments of loneliness, but eventually they come there. I mean, if you stay true to who you are and you don't, you know, give up and go live in a cave, then, you know, everything, you know, everything has a season and you have to understand that after winter, spring will come. Yeah. And I think when you first start that journey, sometimes you go through that sort of dark night of the soul where you're kind of alone and you feel a little lonely and you're looking at your own depression and your own shame and your own anger and your own you know, feelings that make you kind of divorced from yourself. And so things change and then you start to pick up and within and you become something new and then new people come into your life and old people come back to your life in a new way and you find a different tribe and you find your own purpose and all kinds of doors open. But there's a little process there where it's like you're tearing something down to build something new and you're using that as sort of a manure to grow a new crop for yourself. And that's, that can be a tricky place to be, especially if you don't realize that kind of everyone has to go through that a little bit or that it's sort of necessary for the next step. And if you can just kind of get through it with a little like, uh, laughter at yourself and grace and just like okay i'll get through this step and i'll get through this step and i'll get through this step um people can get caught there though and so it's it's something to know ahead of time if if you can figure that out yeah there is always the danger of getting stuck stuck in your yeah. own crap <laughs> and it's easy to do it's almost like sticky to you because it's yours right and it's all these things that you've had for a long time and that's why they talk about working on yourself so much um, because you, you create so many of your own problems at some point you're going to have to remedy them and no one else can do it for you. You know, really, I think that thing of just like, I'm going to do what I can today. What's the smallest thing I can do to move myself forward right now in some way, whatever it is, even if it just makes me smile for 10 minutes, then, then I'll do that. And then tomorrow I'll get up and do it again. And you do it again. And then in five years, you have such a different life that people around you are like, how did you even get over here? How did you get so happy? How did you go over there? How am I, how come you're so much more successful now? And everything that you touch changes a little bit because you've changed yourself so much. That's so true. And, and that's, you know, that's always the, the benefit of hindsight is that it's crystal clear It's 2020, but while you're going through it, you're, a, you may not have that clarity. Yeah, you almost certainly won't, you know, because you're remaking yourself and you're going somewhere you've never been. And you're sort of forging a new path and a new person inside and that's kind of the beauty and when you look back on it you're like man that was really kind of beautiful it was somewhat excruciating at the time but it like broke open the shell that allowed me to sort of give birth to me in a whole new way exactly and it was you know I talk frequently on the podcast about hitting my rock bottom but it was through hitting rock bottom that I became who I am today the podcast wouldn't exist my online uh, membership group, Nectar, that would, none of it would exist if I hadn't gone through that, that process of death and rebirth. And maybe that it's true all the time. Maybe it, it's a necessary ingredient because it was certainly true for me. I spent years in misery as I was working through some health problems and working through some trauma and I was putting together the methods that I put in my system to help myself heal and grow. But what I have now is I would consider it literally a treasure for myself. And without it, I, I wouldn't have that treasure. I just have a life that was kind of bland and wasn't tasty to me. And even as a kid, I was like, I can't live this way. I just can't. Even if I have to go over this way by myself, even if I have to walk to India and find a teacher or whatever I have to do, I'm going to figure this out. Um, but not everyone does it that way. My way was a little <laughs> painful. And it's not necessarily the best way to do it, but um, there's a lot of ways to get there. And just because you and I maybe did it a certain way, but maybe there's always, a, you know, sort of breaking open of yourself that that's a little painful. You know? 
Yeah. What's, what's the old saying? Uh, you can't make an, a cake without breaking a couple of eggs. Yeah, exactly. You, 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 sometimes you do have to shake it up just to see where the pieces fall and then start to put it back together. Now you mentioned your system. Can you maybe share how you actually work with people and what your system is? Sure. So, um, there's a couple of things I do. So as a practice, I'm a somatic therapist and I work with people with their body and I'm talking to them. And if you saw me do it, it would look similar to massage or chiropractic and I'm working through their body and talking to them. The system I have works on every part of you though. So it works with your mind and it works your emotions and it works with your body and your energies. And it's all designed to help improve your life experience through your own efforts. And so there's a lot of cool methods I have for working with your body and for working with how your body connects to your mind and how your mind connects to your emotions and how your emotions and mind and body connect to your spirit and how that all works energetically. And so I tried to build something as comprehensive as I could to completely change myself. And now I'm trying to use that to help other people do it because I like to give some other people what I made for myself and how useful it was. Can you maybe share what some of those techniques are so that people can perhaps explore them for themselves? Sure. The first one I always like to start with is getting people to sort of put as much attention on themselves in every day as they do their outside world. So I'm sitting here talking to you and I'll kind of put some of my attention on my mind. I'll put some of my attention on my emotions. I'll put some attention on my body as much as I'm giving to you and as much as I'm talking to you so that I'm always partly aware of myself. I'm always remembering who I am and where I'm at. And it was one of the most amazing things I've ever discovered was doing that. It changes everything. It lights up your life. It makes you more energetic. You start to see what thoughts you have that are sort of negative and pushing against you, like the ones like, oh, you can't do this podcast. You'll sound like a, like a jerk or whatever, you know? And so you see those thoughts and the emotions that come up. Or, and after you do that for a while, all kinds of doors open. You get a little more access to your mind. You get a little more access to your emotions. And we're all so used to putting all our attention outside of ourselves that it's a technique that kind of got lost, or maybe it's a natural function that a lot of people lost. And if you're going to practice that, don't start it in a car or on a motorcycle or something. <laughs> that is not the time to do it. But when you're sitting alone and maybe you're playing with your dog, just see if you can like keep some attention on your own self, like in those shooter games where you can like toggle between yourself or what you're looking at in a game this is like keeping yourself in the frame a little bit you know where your body is you know where your mind is you know where your emotions are um, and if I could give everybody one thing it would be this um, so that they could get started and then we can stack a bunch of things on it like here's some interesting ways of using your mind and your emotions but at first you have to get a little more aware of what's going on all the time and then you'll see a lot more of those triggers we were talking about things where people can push your button over here or push your button over there or whatever it might be and that allows you to become a lot more authentic because it's like you're using your attention and your energy to um, feed you it's like feeding the essence and the of who you are and you can become more of that so it's it starts with being present and in the you know being in being in the state of being rather in the state of doing because i always associate doing as in you know sort of what's going on externally in your world yeah. and and being is really when you turn you know your attention to yourself and what you're thinking feeling and you know what energies are moving in your body yeah i mean we're just adding more complexity you know so a lot of people when they talk about being or mindfulness or something they're they're still outside of themselves quite a bit you know and so i like to be a little more specific you know, as you add up and you can ramp that up more and more. Um, and then eventually you can learn how to kind of quiet your mind down and get your thoughts to stop completely, or you can get your emotions to pick up in these different ways. But at first it starts from this sort of not being so dragged into the external environment that you're still there with yourself all the time. And I'd say that's a pretty good definition of self-love too. It's like, you're still giving yourself as much attention as you would people in your life, and your own mind, your own emotions, your own being, just like you said. In that concept of self-love, a lot of the times when I talk to people, their first thought is, you know, whether you're talking about self-love, self-care, I mean, for me, they're sort of hand in hand, but people's first reaction is that it's selfish to be putting yourself first. And really it's far from it. Well, how are you going to give what you don't have? Right. Exactly. And so if you're like, if you're cutting, cutting off your leg to help other people, you know, the next you're only gonna be able to do that twice. And then everyone has to take care of you, you know? And so there's a, an important principle that you, you have to take care of yourself first because you can't carry your family along with you if, if you're in trouble, you know? And so at first you have to start there. And 
there's a little bit of almost manipulation behind a lot of these things that people have been talking about for thousands of years all over the world. You're selfish if you care about yourself or you're selfish if you feel good about yourself or you're hurting me if you're not doing X, Y, and Z. And so I always come back to this, like how many things are in our lives that are a little bit manipulative to get you to do or feel or think things that help other people and not you which is a little different than being actively manipulative and, you know, taking advantage of people and leaving people hanging. You, you know what I mean? There, there, there is that side, of course, where people are actually being that kind of selfish that hurts other people around them. Um, so a little distinction. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, once we turn the attention on ourselves, what are some of those things that we can stack on top of that? Um, like with your body, one of the best things is learning how to sit up straight. Um, Because most people, they're kind of leaned in all kinds of ways. And you begin to realize, because I talk to people about their physical health all day, that you actually can cause problems with your digestion. You can give yourself headaches. It's a little good place to start because you work with your body and that helps your mind and your emotions slow down. Uh, I think one of the best things that's useful as a next step for your mind is to actually write down your thoughts. So your thoughts are moving really quickly. And if you have never taken like an hour or two to try to write them all down, it, you can miss just a ton of them. You'll be like, oh, I didn't know I was thinking about this. And I didn't know I was thinking about that. And after you do that for a while, they become a lot more clear. Um, with your emotions, I think the best thing to start to do from there is to label them. Like, what emotion am I feeling right now? Is this anger? Is this frustration? Is this fear? Am I feeling salubrious? Do I even know what salubrious means? And English has these great, you know, emotive words that no one knows because we're all stuck in like, thinking about four or five emotions, if we think about them at all, and we're not actively suppressing them all the time. So once you start to do that, then you can build more and more and put them together. And you say, okay, well, what thoughts help me feel totally vital and full of life? And then you can work your life that way. And then you say, okay, in what way do I use my body that will make me feel more, well, let's say less afraid. And sitting up is another good one. When you're feeling afraid, if you can sit up a little bit, it'll settle your system out. And a lot of the martial arts, they'll start you that way. Like, here's how you stand up. Here's how you deal with the situation because it changes how you feel. And you'll start to see all these connections that are moving everything around. So once you start to see it, and that you have to really see it first, otherwise you're trying to change things where they're moving out from under your feet. Um, but then, like I said, you can stack more and more things on top of it. So you mentioned, you know, sitting up straight. I mean, we live in a world that we're plagued. Everything, you know, seemingly making us hunch over. <laughs> absolutely you know whether it's you know our our laptops our phones our devices whatever it is we're always you know sort of pitched forward and hunched over and, and it's only when you sort of you know, now I got to get up and stretch that you sort of feel it that you're like oh wait a second my neck and shoulders what am I doing do you have any tips on you know how we can do something as simple as sit up straight yeah, there's a wonderful exercise that goes back all over the world in a bunch of different physical culture and development systems where they'll teach you how to sit on a line or stand on a line. And so the basic practice is you feel a line that comes down through the center of your head and goes in between your ears and then goes right in front of your spine because your spine's not actually in the center of your body. And as that line goes through you, you just kind of want your spine to align to that line itself. And so you're actually kind of sitting yourself up against gravity. Right. And you don't want to force it. You want it to be nice and easy. And you, when you do it, when you're standing, you just put your feet underneath you. So that line goes down your legs into the ground. And so after you do that for a while, and you have to do practice it every day for a while, it'll start to do itself. So I'm talking to you and I'm sitting on a wooden chair and I'm sitting up straight because I've spent a lot of time practicing that. But if you'd seen me when I was 12, I'd be laid back and my head would be over here and my back would be hurting because I didn't know how to do that yet. But this practice of sitting on the line or walking on the line, it's a great place to start. And you begin to realize that all your musculature is being used all the time to hold you in weird positions. And so when you get good at it, all of a sudden you have more energy for the rest of your life because you're not burning it up in muscular contraction, which is one of the coolest things that comes out of that is all of a sudden you're like, oh, I feel more energetic. I have a little bit more life to use, but it takes a little while to get there. You're not going to get there probably by Friday at 3 p.m. or something. You got to practice it for, for a few weeks, a few months, maybe even a few years before that really sets up on its own. But when it does, it changes your body pretty substantially. Well, it's because, you know, our bodies, they get used to supporting us in the unhealthy fashion. And it's, it's like, it has to work over time to hold yeah, yourself in, in poor posture. And that's where you're sort of depleting yourself is because you're burning your energy by sitting or standing or, or doing something that's actually harmful to your body. 
Yeah. And it starts to push on your emotions and mind too. Cause all of a sudden you have this pain in your neck and then you're irritable and then you might become angry and you don't realize that you're kind of angry and you don't have a lot of emotional resources because your body hurts and your body hurts because you're used to being in all these weird positions, like staring down at your phone or, you know, all kinds of weird positions that you don't think about because you don't really have attention on your body. We have all, like I said before, you have all your attention outside of you. And so you don't recognize that you're all contorted up in some kind of weird position um, that's affecting you on all kinds of levels. Definitely. Now, Todd, as we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our listeners? You know, one of the things I like to, to tell people is that there's a part of them that's like transcendent of their experiences, you know, and so a lot of people get stuck thinking I can't get past this or my past is too bad or I don't have enough time left. I'm 98 and I might not have much time left to change who I am. And so I like to tell people there's something about you that's beyond your body and it's beyond your mind and it's beyond your emotions and your experiences that um, is always there as you. And so you can change your life with that, even no matter where you might be. And I think that's really the message of hope for human beings. There's always a chance that you can improve yourself and your own experience um, right here and now, you know, I think that's wonderful. Definitely an important message. And where is the best place for people to connect with you? So probably at my website. Um, I originally called my system the Nihome Vital Life Method, which is just my last name and Vital Life Method. And one of my editors is like, that is way too long. And so we came up with a way of shortening it. And so it became Nitality. So it's the NY from my last name and then an abbreviation of Vitality. So N-Y-T-A-L-I-T-Y.com. Perfect. If you are looking at connecting with Todd, make sure you check out the show notes. I will have all of the links in there. And Todd, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I love talking about this. A really wonderful episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. Life is like a roller coaster, baby.